friends, this is Pastor Benjamin Faircloth of Ignited Church of Livonia, Georgia, and I want to thank you so much for tuning in to Prophetic Worldview. I'm excited about this particular interview. Uh, I have a great friend of mine I've known since at least 2002, Brian Stewart. He is the uh, uh, Director of Action Ministries for USA and uh, also just a pioneer, if you will, in the ministry in Cuba. Been doing a great job down there. And uh, I am so, so excited that he's going to be with us for this interview. So, hey, Brian, welcome to Prophetic Worldview. Yeah, it's great to see you again and to catch up and remember some of the times when we traveled to Cuba together. Um, I, that was very kind of you to call me a pioneer. It has been 22 years working in Cuba. We got in there right when Cuba was opening up in the year 2000. And um, boy, time goes fast. Yeah, you don't look like you've aged one day. <laughs> well, I, I certainly feel like it. That's very, I like, I appreciate the compliment though. I'll take all the encouragement I can get. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It was 2002. Uh, the Lord had been dealing with my heart to go to Cuba and various, various nations of the world. And I didn't really know anybody uh, to contact, uh, came across your information on the internet. You were so gracious, so kind. And uh, I called you the gatekeeper. Uh, uh -huh. because, you know, you had already the inroads down there. And then 2003, we went to Santiago de Cuba uh, with your wife, my wife, and some others. And we traveled all around. And I think we finally departed out of Havana. Yeah, it was quite a tour. And that was when my wife learned that uh, she had a calling to be a translator. The <laughs> one thing that she asked me before we traveled together, she said, don't make me translate. Yeah. Now, she's Mexican and speaks English fluently, so it was not going to be a big deal, but she was anxious about it. And then one evening, we were in the Salvation Army Church, Yep. and it was time for Jen to go preach, Yes. and the translator had an ectopic pregnancy and was in the hospital. <laughs> so I handed my wife her glasses and yeah. her Bible, and yeah. I said, it's time. You have to go in this taxi <laughs> with Jen, and you have to be the translator, and she found out she loved it. And that's one of her callings to ministry is to help people wow. communicate down there. Wow. Welcome to the ministry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you always tell God, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to. And then all of a sudden there it is. Wow. Yeah. Well, it, I'll never forget that opportunity. And I, I won't forget the opportunity since then. And uh, the Lord has been doing some great things in your ministry down there. And that, yeah, I use the word pioneer because, you know, a pioneer is a person who sticks to it. Uh, mm -hmm. so many flash in a pan ministries go to foreign nations. They start something, uh, they, they leave the people hanging or what have you, but your ministry has a track record of faithfulness. And that's, that's, what's incredible to me. And I want you to talk about some of those things, Brian, as far as the past of what you've done in Cuba, uh, where you are now, and then where you're headed. Let's start with, uh, with the past mm -hmm. and, and the beginning days. Well, in the early days, um, when I first went down there in uh, September of the year 2000, I was meeting pastors, um, very experienced, mature, godly men who had not met an American, you know, in 20 years. Wow. And with regards to foreign visitors and foreign assistants, they were not connected. The Cuban church was completely isolated from the world. Uh, in, during the 70s, 80s, and especially the 90s, when they went through that terrible economic turmoil. And things began to change about 1999. We got in there in the year 2000, and the spiritual need was immense. And at that time, pastors didn't ask for money, medicine, food. They were saying, um, can you bring us Bibles? Can you bring us Bible study material? Can you bring us discipleship material? Um, because Cuba was open now to spiritual matters and it was no longer um, a black mark against you to be a Christian, mm. all of the people who had spiritual hunger were coming forward. And the wow. church didn't have the resources to disciple that multitude. And so we got there at just the right time, you know, in God's providence, it was amazing. And so those early years, we did a lot of large events like the ones that uh, you came to in 2003. Yes. We would often do a five day discipleship retreat for three or 400 people. Wow. And we would have teaching from morning through lunch and then also in the evening because that was the need of the church at the time. 
is to help the local church basically disciple thousands of people. When we got there, you know, there's they thought maybe there was a hundred thousand Christians in Cuba. Hmm. And now 22 years later, they guesstimate 900,000 to a million. Wow. So the church has grown amazingly in two decades and they've been kind of running to catch up. Yeah. For an Island that only has around 11 million people or so that's, that's an incredible percentage, I think. It is. They don't have, you know, the political and social clout that you would think that if, if they're eight, nine, ten percent of the population. Right. Right. Yeah. In that particular society, in that structure, they don't have the clout that that group should have. But it's pretty exciting because God has been moving in a big way for 20 years. The needs of the church have changed over 20 years. And so we've adapted our ministry style to meet those needs. And but for the first several years, everything we did was was really big. We were printing, there, we did a project where we printed a million tracks so that people wow. could go out in the street and witness. Right. We did, uh, we would do Bible study materials at 25,000 copies a year. And um, everything was really, really big. And then as pastors and leaders grew in the Lord and grew in experience, they needed other things and, and maybe different types of things over the years. Right. And that's one thing I love about action in the course, you know, you're the director of this, the whole, I call it the Cuba project. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, is, is the fact that you didn't, you didn't, and you don't, and you never will go down there for photo ops. I mean, it was always <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> hands on the plow. You were always there working and uh, the results were absolutely incredible and still are. And, uh, and I wanted the people to kind of get a flair uh, and, and an understanding that, you know, in those beginning days, it, it was not easy to do all this. It was really hard pioneering work. And it was the favor of the Lord, really, that gained you a lot of access and opportunity down there. Yeah, it was the favor of the Lord for sure. And we had some very difficult situations as Cuba was reopening itself to foreigners coming in, especially Americans. Right. And as they were skeptical of the motives right of americans right um we got into some real issues uh in 2004 so a year after you traveled with me uh i i was questioned because there was some thinking that i might be a cia cia operative if you right. can believe that <laughs> you look like one yeah i i said <laughs> they pulled me out of line at the airport and they started questioning and one of the first very direct blunt questions was um are you here using money from the U.S. government? <laughs> I thought, if you only knew you know what we've been... <laughs> just to fundraise and to pray the money in so that we could go there. Right. No, the government's not helping me. But they were very, very skeptical. Right. And interestingly, I learned a difficult lesson in that culture because of the government restrictions. They were very suspicious because I was just interacting with regular church members. Right. They expected right. an American leader to come in and act like a VIP and only to visit pastors and uh, presbyters, right. and superintendents. Yeah. And I would just visit the home of anybody who invited me in. <laughs> You'd just be <laughs> just grateful to get in I, the house. <laughs> they thought that was really suspicious. Oh, gosh. And, they, and they just, uh, and because as you mentioned, we would travel around to different cities and try to meet as many people as possible. Right. So, um, yeah, there, there were some difficult times, and uh, at the time, they, they told me I wasn't going back. Well, wow. that was about 50 trips ago, so <laughs> you, you talk about the God's favor. Yeah. That was one of two or three times that I was told, you're finished, action's finished, you're wow. not coming wow. back, and here we are. We're still standing, yeah. we're still traveling. Yeah. I was just down there last month, and God has kept that door open, even though some very important people have wanted to close it. Yeah, again, that goes back to, I, I know I keep saying it's the pioneering spirit because the pioneer says, you're not going to chase me off that easy. I'm, I'm just not going to run off. I have an investment here and I have a calling here, an assignment. And that's definitely what you guys have had down there because I remember some of those intense moments, you know, where you had these major meetings and we won't go into all the details, but, you know, major meetings that most people would have cowtailed 
and <laughs> said, you know what, this ain't for me. This is too hard because, you know, by the way, church is supposed to be easy. Well, no, it's not, you know, not when you're pioneering like that. Yeah, and I credit just the inspiration of the Holy Spirit because I actually got kicked out of the country in 2004. And again, the accusations were very serious. They went through my briefcase, my suitcase, my notebooks, my camera. Yeah. And they said, you're not coming back. And I got to the Miami airport mm. and I thought, I was poorly treated. I am going to complain. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. I had the international director of our uh, mission help me craft a statement of complaint to the Cuban government as to how I was treated. Wow. That put it, the ball back in their court and they said, well, we're not going to allow you to do ministry, but come back so we can talk about this issue. No problem. <laughs> and I think we gained some level of respect by standing up for ourselves and saying, you know, we're here to, to help you. We're here to help the people. You shouldn't treat us like that. And so that was the meeting. I've been in Communist Party headquarters a few times with these yes. difficult meetings to work things out. But in that meeting, they told me all the things I was doing wrong. And they said, if you stop doing this and act more properly, you can come back. And you did. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have never actually been, you know, I've never been told don't preach the gospel. Right. But with regards to, as a foreigner, how I conduct myself in the country, you know, I've, I've learned what is appropriate by their standards. Right. Um, but, you know, uh, one good thing and to say is that because we always go in on the religious workers visas, we do have total freedom to disciple and to preach and to spread uh, Bible study materials. And that has been a constant thing. Um, who we connect with, who they're suspicious of, mm -hmm. that's just, you know, we have to learn those ropes because there's a lot of scrutiny right. and the state security is very sure to make, you know, that you're on the up and up yep. and that you're not connecting with individuals who have ulterior motives. Right. But, our motives are pure. God knows that. I think the government's convinced of that. And now it's really, Benjamin, it's doors wide open for ministry. Wow. Well, you know, I, I want to flash back real quick to that, because a lot of people don't remember this. There's a certain president who absolutely said, and you know what I'm talking about, uh, you know, we're going to use the church down there to, <laughs> to, to do what we need done. And it's like, no, don't say that. And that yeah. put you under more scrutiny and others, you know, us, that, that went down there. So that, that's the backstory of all that. Yeah, that's actually how I got into trouble and why there was a suspicion and accusation is that there was a, a lengthy document published saying that for the United States to help Cuba transition politically, right. they would start teaching democratic principles through the churches. And that made the Cuban government think that American missionaries were on a political mission instead of a spiritual mission. Exactly. And so we all came under, you know, suspicion. And I'm sure that, uh, I'm sure you, Benjamin, on your many trips, they checked you out. They checked out your Facebook page. They checked out as much as they possibly could. They would have interviewed pastors that you had connected with in Cuba yeah. to see what you were really saying behind the scenes. But yeah, there, there's a reasons why, uh, American missionaries were under such scrutiny as the U.S. government actually put it in a document that that Incredible. would be a good way to make political change. Yeah, and you're the first one to ever tell me, says, oh, by the way, welcome to Cuba. Uh, you now have a, a file, an old KGB file for you in Havana. I was like, oh, great, awesome. Yeah. <laughs> this is exciting. But, yeah, again, though, that because our motives are pure and we're really just there to help the church. Exactly. Once they're convinced of that, then you do have a lot of freedom. Yeah. They're yeah, just we, wanting to make sure that you're there for the reason that you said you're there for. Right. And that's all governments have that, that right, right and sovereignty. And I'm, I'm fine with that. Our, our government is not of this world anyways. Uh, we're right. of the kingdom yeah. and we've got a message that's totally different than what their, uh, their message. Yeah, come quickly, Lord Jesus. We need a new king. <laughs> now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yesterday was a little too late, you know. So, Brian, you know, I get your newsletters, and as, as I've, uh, I've mentioned in the past, you know, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking, you know, to, to, to hear all that's happening, the, the flight, the plight, the whole nine yards of the Cuban church, and, you know, and, and especially when you've been out for a little while, I haven't been down there for a little while, and, uh, but, but God is doing tremendous things, and, and the last newsletter I saw of yours, uh, you guys got a print shop, I mean, what in the world, what's that, what's happening with that? 
Well, yeah, as I was mentioning earlier, one of the first experiences we had when we got into Cuba was this tremendous request for Bible study material. And there was just nothing available. People didn't have Bibles, let alone, let alone missionary biographies and devotional books and Bible study material. And so the pastor would say, can you please bring us some Christian books? And I would say, what books? And they'd say, any book, <laughs> <laughs> anything, bring us anything. We haven't seen anything. And the um, distribution, you know, it, things were so scarce and so valuable that if a book came into Cuba, it went to the pastor. Uh, your average church member wouldn't have any Christian books on the bookshelf. They were considered too valuable and too scarce. Uh, they had to go to the church library for the pastor. So we started in 2005 to print, and we printed tracts. We were doing about 25,000 books a year. Wow. But it was always uh, very risky because everything was done on the black market. Uh, we were doing this with church-based print shops that were getting paper delivered at like three in the morning so that nobody would see that and um, paper mm. purchased on the black market mm. and, you know, being very careful how we moved books around the country and things of this nature. Our dream was to have a fully legal, authorized, well-equipped print shop. Well, sometimes dreams take a while to develop. And so it <laughs> took 16 or 17 years. Wow. We just learned to live within the restrictions. And I think I, frankly, to be honest with you, Benjamin, I stopped praying about it. There was a time where a church had dedicated a part of their property for our print shop. And mm -hmm. we prayed about it. We talked to the government officials about it. They never said no, but we could never make it happen either. Uh -huh. And we just kept with our regular routine and out of the blue, kind of when I thought that this was not going to really happen in my lifetime, from one week to the next, a beautiful, well-equipped, fully equipped, legal authorized print shop was offered to us by one of these couples that was leaving the country urgently to go to Nicaragua. Wow. And they needed cash. They had been closed during COVID, so they mm -hmm. hadn't had much income, if any. Right. And they wanted cash to leave the country and they were glad to put it in our hands because we had a good reputation in the city. And so for $25,000, we got a fully equipped uh, print shop with a retail wow. location in downtown Camagüey. Uh, <laughs> and so we'll be servicing wow. all sorts of businesses and industries and also have full legal authority to print all Christian material that we want. Wow. So it, it, it can be for, for profit and also for, for the ministry at the same time. Yeah, the overhead wow. is not much. Uh, it's uh, $11 per month for the rent. <laughs> uh, and we have uh, the government renewed our lease for 10 years. So we're going to be there for a decade at least. And wow. it, it does need to be profitable. Right. But the fact is, we, you know, the churches need all sorts of Sunday school material and tracks and all sorts of things. And now we can do that without being concerned that there's going to be, you know, a knock on the door. Now the knock on the door is just going to be a customer. Right. <laughs> we have full legal right to, yeah. to, to sell it yeah. or we can print for free. It's, it's going to be amazing. It's um, by Cuban standards, right. even though some of this equipment is like from the 1950s to the 1980s, it is a well-equipped, really nice print shop. And we're praising God for it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, you probably, I don't know if you can get into some of the details, but it, it's, it's not been without cost, human cost too. Uh, you know, uh, one of the brothers you had mentioned before who had uh, paid a big yeah. price for that. Well, again, it, um, it was not technically illegal to print Christian material, right? but you couldn't get the materials to do so. It, right. it, it was illegal to to buy everything on the black market, to buy paper and ink and things of that nature. And during one of those transactions, one of our good friends who was running a, a church-based print shop was arrested. Wow. He was jailed. He did have to go to trial. By God's grace, he had a Christian lawyer, or maybe the lawyer had, I think the lawyer had Christian parents at the very least. And he got off with a warning. Now that was over a decade ago, and even though he was warned, 
he felt such a call that he kept running his print shop. Man. But as the scrutiny grew, whether it was in Camagüey or Santiago, um, print shops began printing less and less and being more and more careful. One print shop just told me last month that they're down 90% over their pre-COVID volume because they're, they're too scared, to be honest with you, they're fearful mm -hmm. of buying paper on the black market. Well, now, thanks to God providing this print shop, we don't have those concerns. It's completely Good. above board. It's Good. completely legal. And our first two customers uh, are already um, government industries. Uh, so <laughs> making the devil pay for it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> That's a, that is I mean, exactly right. Wow. We'll make money off of the paying customers Praise and we'll God. just try to keep our prices as low as possible for the churches. Awesome. Well, I'd like to be a client. I've got several books I like translated in Spanish. So Amen. let me know what let me know what I got to do. I want to be a part of it. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be absolutely fantastic. Yeah. We are what? we printed we no, we had to the one thing I forgot to do in my fundraising is I was just fundraising for the price of the print shop to buy it from the owners. Right. I forgot how much paper we would have to purchase. So we did some oh. separate fundraising and I think now we have half a million sheets of paper ready to go. Wow. Wow. That's that's incredible. We, well, you're yeah because you're we're friends. You you know this before it's even kind of public, but right, we're not really people have been knocking on the door. We're not completely reopened yet, but March first we hope to publicly reopen. All right. And this has all happened within about thirty days. Yeah. Wow. That, Sixteen to seventeen years in the process. Thirty days. Bam. God does it. Right. Well, is yeah. Sixteen wow. to seventeen years, and the. Between the time I found out about the offer of the print shop and the fact yeah. that our team members owned it, that took about eight days. Eight days. After, after all that waiting, when it was God's wow. timing, he, <laughs> we were rushing to catch up. Isn't that just like him, though? Yeah. I, I just, again, wow. I, I had kind of put it out of my mind as something that was not going to be achievable. Right. And I just, I just hadn't seen that now was Man. the time. And thankfully... We recognize that and donors recognize that. And we raised 25,000 bucks in about three days. And, wow. and then it was ours for the glory of God and for the benefit of his churches. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and they need that. They need that translation. They need those books. They need to hear what the other authors are saying around the world. And uh, uh, theologically, you know, because of uh, the need for teaching and, and, so this is an incredible, incredible uh, act of, of, of a miracle, in my opinion, of what the Lord has done. What's the name of it? You guys got a name yet? We're working on that. <laughs> Thank you for that question. I always try to yeah. find names that can be understood both in Spanish and English, and we're, it's <laughs> kind of tricky. We're right. still working on it. But right. yeah, we're excited because although there are now, you know, there, there are many more books in circulation in Cuba, mm -hmm. now there's a, maybe a, as many as a million Christians. So you right. still have a lot of faithful believers who have no personal library of Christian books. Right. So there's still a lot that we can do to help them. You know, some of the thought just crossed my mind, Brian. Also, this will help keep false doctrines out of the church down there in Cuba, because you guys will be printing truth, Bible basics, mm -hmm. you know, to help combat. I, I believe some of your authors uh, teach on the cults and things like that. Is that correct? Yeah, we've had... Uh, issues with the government, uh, you have to be very uh, politically correct in how you challenge other belief systems. Right. Um, but yeah, you're correct. Um, there are so many godly leaders, and I know that you're friends with so many down in Cuba, and um, they haven't had the benefit of a lot of structured teaching and a chance to go through mm -hmm. all of the doctrines systematically and really um, get grounded. In, right. And so... They're doing the best that they possibly can, but the church is growing by leaps and bounds, whether it's the Pentecostals or the Baptists. You have a lot of lay leaders who are godly, faithful, prayerful yeah. individuals with yeah. not much training. All of a sudden, they're, they're in charge of 30, 40 people because the church has grown to that extent. And unfortunately, because many pastors have left the country. Yeah, speak to that a little bit, Brian, before we got on, on the uh, recording here. We were talking about the retirement of pastors, those that were in the Castro era, 
uh, yeah. that, that really fought the good fight of faith. They're the pioneers. I mean, those are the guys that yeah. really blood, sweat, right. and tears. And then you have the younger generation that I don't want to use the word abandoned ship, but you can understand their plight, you know, of wanting a new life and, and all that the world and the Western world has to offer. The Church of Cuba is in a, in a very interesting position right now. So could you talk a little bit about that? And that'll be a pr good prayer point for all of us as well. Yeah, it really is a matter for prayer because many pastors were describing the current circumstances as a mass exodus. Mm. Um, Nicaragua opened their borders to Cubans so Cubans can fly there without needing a visa. Wow. And Cubans began to dream that they could get to Nicaragua and somehow make it through Central America, through Mexico and up to the U.S. border. They're all trying to get to the United States. And we're talking about 800,000 people already who wow. have left Cuba into Nicaragua. And it's very interesting because, you know, it's uh, the younger generation is not seeing much of a future. And it's been aggravated by the last two years of COVID, the last year with 400% inflation. And I had a young college student tell me in January that Cuba is kind of a dream killer. Wow. They have a lot, you know, that they want to accomplish in life, and they don't think that they can get it done in Cuba. So they're leaving. Pastors are losing a percentage of, you know, their under 35s who are trying to get out of the country. Mm -hmm. And on, on the other end of the spectrum, pastors who are retirement age or a little bit beyond retirement age, they would like to settle down. <laughs> but there's such a demand for pastors because there aren't enough to go around. And now their life savings have been absolutely depleted. They can't retire. Wow. So you've got on both ends of the spectrum, you've got a lot of discontent and frustration. And then you've got these pastors in the middle ages, 35 to 55, who are the glue holding it all together. Right. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's a tough situation. And I think maybe that's been some of the undercurrent of what's been happening down there. I know we're not going to really speak to what's going down there politically, but I think that's part of the undercurrent because of the frustration on those different spectrums uh, or ends of the spectrum here, uh, which is just the, you know, the church is the microcosm or what's going on is the microcosm of the church, however you want to state that. Uh, it's definitely a spiritual vortex that's happening mm -hmm. in Cuba, which I believe personally, it, it, theologically, is a great recipe for revival and for yeah. great things to happen. What do you, what do you think about that for, for the future of Cuba? Yeah, I think that um, it's a fantastic opportunity for the church to get out in society and not only preach, but also show practical demonstrations of God's love. And people are so open uh, mm. in every regard. It was kind of like this, you know, 22 years ago, they were coming through the special period of the 1990s right. and they were, look, they were looking for hope. Mm. And they had been through a period of physical hunger but also spiritual hunger and looking for some answers beyond kind of the miserable life they were leading. Because of COVID, because of the 400% inflation, people are asking those questions again. And the church now at a million people strong has a great opportunity to reach out. And people, they always want to be prayed for. They're always receptive to hearing the gospel. This generation um, was not raised with as much atheism and Marxism as previous generations. So they don't necessarily have the firm belief system that you might think that Cuba has, whether it's right. athe Marxism or Catholicism, that's not necessarily ingrained and people don't necessarily, they're kind of wandering spiritually. Wow. Okay. They're very, very open to have conversations and to hear about the Lord. Yeah. What, a, what an opportunity and, and I think I'm going to word this word out, but going back to pioneering, again, pioneers, seriously, I mean, they, they really position themselves for the harvest. And, and they don't cut bait. They don't, they don't run. They don't leave, you know, when times get tough. And then God rewards them. And I believe God's rewarding yeah. you guys. I really believe that. I believe more is going to come down the road. There's no doubt about it. So, you know, you've heard it said before, don't let a good crisis go to waste. But, you know, <laughs> God doesn't let crises yeah. ever go to waste. You know, it's an opportunity uh, when man looks at it and says, well, it's futile. God says, no, it's not final at all with mm -hmm. him. It's just the beginning of a new page. What, uh, as we turn the corner here, uh, Brian, 
what, what do you see action up to the next uh, next decade or so, next five years? You, you know, what's the future plans? What's happening? Yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, we definitely have changed from the days when you know the church said, um, I would say, what what do you want us to teach on? And they would say, any topic. <laughs> what book do you want me to bring? Any book. Right. Well, the church has matured and grown, mm -hmm. and so now uh, foreigners who want to be involved with the growth of the church have to be uh, have to fit into what their needs are. The church still has lots of needs for discipleship and teaching on specific topics, but they have a lot of very experienced pastors who can cover the rest. So we don't want to duplicate what's already being done. Right. So they call it kind of like a niche. We got to find the way that our expertise and um, you know um, can can fit into their need. Mm -hmm. right. So I'm kind of I'm always looking for those opportunities. And there's opportunities in ministering to different types of groups that are still unreached. Uh, we have ministry to the deaf, ministry to yes. single mothers. There's specific categories where the church has asked for help. Right. The churches are, are absolutely overwhelmed. Usually one pastor, a small leadership team for two or 300 people. Um, many of them are bivocational, mm -hmm. just out of necessity. So when you ask, they will, they have a vision and they know exactly where you can plug in. The other thing that's really big for us right now is uh, sustainable uh, business ventures. Okay. So we, um, we have two farms uh, that right. uh, members of our team run because we, we were buying all this food during right. COVID because mm -hmm. people were going hungry, especially the elderly. And we said, we should stop buying the food. We should start farming and producing food. Yeah. And so we're doing those. Um, those have been, they, they get to break even pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, so they don't require additional capital. Now we've got the print shop. We've got two taxis uh, wow, that people operate God. and trying to, you know, be a little bit more sustainable. So we're less dependent right. on the donations and it can be continued into the next generation. As you know, Benjamin, some of the people that you met in 2003, mm -hmm. you know, they've got kids now and <laughs> some of the teenagers we met are experienced pastors yeah and so we want action to be able to continue into the future which means put the resources into the cubans hands and empower them and then help the church where they invite you to help yeah that's a powerful statement you made right there because uh so many missions organizations uh don't see it that way they want to take control put their brand implement the americanism if that's even mm. a word, into the structure and culture of the yeah. life. And they actually taint the purity of what the culture is, and, and they, they mess it up. And uh, I think you guys have stayed pure to that fact to let the Cubans run with it. Uh, I Listen, I, I've never met a more industrious people. I've been around right. the world, as, as you have, and uh, they're just phenomenal people. And yes, you know, the, they, they can take a, you know, a rock and make it into whatever. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. And so I think the real principle is, is not just a cliche or a theory, it's actual practical um, uh, principles you guys have been doing over the years and it works. I wish more did that. Hmm. Well, thank you for saying that. I, I think, you know, when I got down there, I was 33 years old and I was relatively inexperienced. It was very easy as I was meeting these pastors who had mm. been through the, the revolutionary days. It was very easy for me to come in as a servant and yeah. maintaining that attitude. Again, there was a time when they needed very big things. Now they need very specific things. They're normally smaller in nature, but we, for example, we still help the Bible school, mm -hmm. but 12 out of the 13 teachers are Cubans. Right. We only, we only send one extra teacher every time. Great. Um, we have a leadership degree program. Five out of the six teachers are Cubans. Nice. But there's, there's still definitely a place to fit in. Mm. But the Cuban church is strong enough to take the lead now. And they, they struggle because they have the same compassion and empathy that we do. They see the physical suffering around them lack of food, or in this case, this year, it's lack of medicine, they feel kind of helpless to meet those needs. 
So as much as we want to help them spiritually, we're so glad to take the suitcases of medicine down yeah. so that they have the joy of meeting pressing needs. Yeah, I saw a newsletter where you, you guys got a bunch of medicines out of, out of Russia, which I thought was, was tremendous. Uh, I know we yeah. were able to send you guys some more over-the-counter yeah. stuff. Hopefully, hopefully you can use it. But, um, you know, these are the things that the, those that are watching right now listening, you know, these are prayer points. These are yep. things that they could be praying about. And uh, before we get to the end of this, I want to uh, for you to share how people can help you. Uh, going back to uh, the farms, it was it came to my mind. Uh, are you doing the kind of like the same carbon copy of what you did in Mexico with the farming? Same concept? Well, um, we're we're still. It's only been since right before COVID hit that uh -huh. we started the farms. Okay. It's been uh, challenging in, in every way, but we have some farms that do crops, some farms that have cows that give milk, and um, we're still, I have to say that we're still developing that, and the idea is to provide food for the community, because the government will, will have a contract with you, right. but everything over and above what they're going to purchase is free for you to sell or give away. Wow. And so we do both. We sell to the government, we sell to local families, and for the most vulnerable, we just give them food. Yeah. And that's something that we can expand right now because, um, you know, not a lot of people in Cuba want to get into farming, but it's a big need for them. It's Benjamin, <laughs> be be before we leave the topic of medicine, I have yeah. to thank you again for sending those boxes. No of essentially, it was uh, like children's Tylenol. Right. I don't know if you remember this, but you asked if I wanted some. I think I said in my email, I probably could take in a shoebox or a suitcase full. <laughs> yeah. You sent me about 250 pounds of medicine. Yes. Yeah. Well, we, we had the thrill of taking that in in January. Crazy. We wow. took in about 70 pounds of the children's um, liquid Tylenol, Good. which for, was for a um, pediatric oncology unit. Wow. That was heartbreaking last year during COVID the nurses contacted me. There's a Christian nurse that's on that floor. And she said, we have no pain reliever. We have nothing for the kids who have fever. These are kids with cancer. Wow. I said, what does it cost? Right. Um, whatever it costs to go buy some of that on the black market, we'll pay it. Right. She said, that's the problem. You'd have to bring it. There's none available anywhere. Wow. So we have uh, took a bunch in January. We've got two people going in march to take more good but good. when when you have nurses and doctors asking for help that just shows the scarcity and our uh, during covid our focus was food this year our focus is going to be medicine asking people to take suitcases of medicine down well that you just you just triggered something to me I, i've got more medicine if you, you can handle it i could send more to you we have a great sister by the name of Rosemary who, who helps mm. us out. And uh, I had some earmarked for Afghanistan, but right now there's been a little uh, a lull there and getting stuff in, mm. as you can imagine. So uh, yeah. not to put you on the spot on the recording here, but if you do want more, just let me know, email me or, or, or just nod your head like that. Yeah, <laughs> I will, send it to you. I'm going to get a list from the team of what the top okay. priorities are. Yeah. And then I, we, we are going to be asking for help because we can do at least 150 pounds in March. Good. And then in May, hopefully we can do even more. And um, that's just going to be our absolute mm. focus yeah. is, um, is, is medicine. Um, again, you mentioned that we sent people to Russia. Uh, I'm glad we mm. did this before war broke out, but yeah. Cubans can get into Russia uh, yep. without needing a visa. True. We sent two guys from our team to bring back 400 pounds of medicine because wow. it was that urgent. Wow. Wow. So you guys listening right now, moving forward, that's something that, you know, they're in, they're in great need of. So we definitely need to be praying about that. And Brian, let us know how we can help. And uh, we will definitely channel those things towards you and be a part of it. We Thank believe, you. we believe in what you're doing down there. It's really exciting. And as I'm listening to your, your stories, I mean, I, I giggle inside. I don't know if my head's like a bobblehead, you know, like this, <laughs> but, but I remember of all the difficulties, you couldn't do these things. It was unheard of having your own cattle, having your own, you know, yeah. produce and chickens and pigs, whatever. And then, you know, here it is just, just waiting the time, letting time go yeah. by. 
I'm going to use the word pioneer. Here you go again. <laughs> you know, just being in the field, waiting and waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, here it comes. And, uh, you know, the, the, the Bible says you have, you know, you have all these teachers, but you have few fathers. Mm. And it's so powerful. A father is, is one that he doesn't just teach you something. He stays with you till you get it. And then he never leaves your side. And I think that's what we're seeing here with your ministry down there and with what's happening with action. And it's, it's producing many spiritual sons and daughters. And uh, I'm excited about it. Uh, Ignited Church is a part of what you're doing down there. Uh, we want to increase that and continue to do that. Uh, having said that, we're going to segue into some information about you. Uh, are you still taking teams down there? Is that still the possibility to join you? Uh, how does that look from, from your, uh, your point of view? Yeah, um, we definitely are still taking teams. Um, it depends, I think, whether the individuals on the team have an expectation of being able to teach and preach or not. That process of getting a religious workers visa uh, is about a hundred day process. Mm -hmm. So you have to really go through a, an evaluation and submit your resume and your itinerary and things of that nature. Right. But we are looking for pastors and Bible study teachers to go in and do small events. Most of our events are now these days, 20 to 50 people. Mm -hmm. um, but we're also, I think this year, looking for a lot of people who just want to go to Cuba, pack their personal stuff in their carry on and bring two suitcases full of medicine and medical supplies. There is a, there's an opportunity there just to go and visit and encourage. I mentioned that when I got there in 2000, Cuba was isolated. Right. Everybody was glad to see visitors. Yeah. They've just been through two years of COVID. Every, they, and the, uh, the economy is so difficult with the 400% inflation. Yeah. They could use some encouragement just going even if you don't think you have a lot to offer, taking those medicines, taking love, time to listen yeah. to them, yeah. we can take you down there, get you a translator, you can visit pastors, visit their families, and this yeah. could be a year of meeting practical needs and encouraging leaders. Yeah, absolutely. I hope to get down there myself this year. Uh, Please do. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm excited about it. My, my whole family wants to go back for sure. Uh, so. Tell us, uh, Brian, uh, I know there's two things here. First of all, if they want to go, what's the uh, information they need to, uh, to receive, contact information, information? And then the second thing is, uh, how, can, how can we help those that are watching? If they feel led to help, they, they can help through our ministry, which, which is sure. great. But if they want to go directly to you, that's great, too. So give us both ways of information to, uh, to help financially and to be a part yeah. of these teams. Yeah, well, yeah, thankfully, um, we do receive such great support from your church, so people could give through you, and you're so faithful to send us something every month, so that could go through that channel, actioninternational.org, actioninternational.org is the website of our organization. If you search for Cuba, we've got um, a number of different pages with, that you could possibly give to where most needed is one of our web pages, and it just allows us the freedom to get whatever, whether it's food or medical supplies or medicine, we can spend it on whatever is most urgent. So that's a nice page to go to. Um, you know, I don't know if we want to combine our, our efforts and get a team going with action and a fair class. I mean, we'd, we'd love for your family to get down there. Maybe if you have some people in your area who want to go. Mm -hmm. um, normally, people going. Uh, for the first time, would like to have an experienced guide and leader sure. like right. you or me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I think I'm going to have teams going May and June and then October, November. Great. Um, and then, of course, there's also, if you have, we, we, we could, somebody could contact me and we always have a shopping list. Primarily this year, it's medicine. But yeah. if you have access to, you know, basic things like pain reliever and children's pain reliever and things of that nature, we are going to be needing some of that so that we can get it down there this year. But there are opportunities. I want to reiterate that. Um, sometimes people feel like only the most gifted teachers <laughs> should no. go on these missions trips. Right. If you, if you feel that the Lord is calling you, if we're talking about Cuba and you say, yeah, I want to be involved, there are things that you can do. Yes. And if you're content 
visiting those who are in the ministry and encouraging them and learning about their lives, going to some church services, maybe sharing your personal testimony in a church service, then you could be a very productive member of a missions team, and, and we'd love to talk to you about it. Yeah, that's great. Uh, one thing's for sure, when you step off off the plane there in Cuba, the, the entire island is a missions field, and there's something for everybody to do down there. That That's for sure. Brian, as we close this, um, I want to give you an opportunity just to pray uh, in general terms, praying for the Cuban church, and and then I'll, I'll end it with a final few words. That's great. We better warn people, though, Pastor Benjamin, that if you go to Cuba once, you will make <laughs> friends for life, and you'll life. want to go back every year. So it's not a one-shot deal. It's kind of like the mafia. <laughs> <laughs> You're in for life. You're in for life, buddy. Yeah. That's a good thing. <laughs> Yeah, it sure is. Yeah. Well, uh, that's great. What a great suggestion. I will, uh, I will go to the Father with some requests and let's yes. pray. Yes. Thank you. Dear Jesus. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for Pastor Benjamin and this um, tremendous friendship we've had for almost two decades. I want to ask your blessing upon the church and upon his family and especially upon the Faircloth's desire to get down to Cuba as a family. Lord, please help us all individually to know how we can help your people in Cuba. Yes. They've been through so much in so many different ways, and their needs are, are great, but also the needs are very basic. Yeah. Um, they need encouragement. They need to feel your presence in their lives, and they need someone who can come alongside, put a hand on their shoulder, pray for them, yes. tell them that God loves them, and that they have friends outside of Cuba who will be praying. Yes. They need simple things like medicine and, and food and maybe shoes for their kids. Father, we can do a lot of that. For each one of us who is just part of this broadcast, we pray that you would work in our lives and our hearts to know the Holy Spirit's intention as to how we could collaborate with you in meeting those needs and blessing these wonderful saints. Yes. We also think of the people in Cuba who are like this college student who said, you know, it's a dream killer down here. Mm. We don't like to see our youth not have optimism yeah. and have a vision for their future. Father, we know how you've changed our lives and given us vision and hope. And I just pray that we'll be able to reach this generation yes. that is kind of disappointed and pessimistic and change their hearts to introduce them to you so that they can envision Yes. what a happy, productive future might look like in your service. I pray that you would just provide for all of the needs, whether it's through us or through others. We yes. hate to see your saints suffering. Right. We pray that you would just um, make all the roads necessary and all the channels necessary so that good things can come to all of those faithful saints in Cuba who are calling yes. out to you. Yes. Thank you in advance. For yes. arranging all the logistics. Thank you for showing us how we can connect with them. And I do pray for all of those leaders in the middle who are watching the younger generation leave and watching mm -hmm. the older generation frustrated because they can't retire. These are the leaders who are committed to your church and they're so overburdened. They're like caught in a vice of pressure and concern. I pray that you would help us who are listening to this broadcast yeah. to be kind of a safety valve and yes. to take some of that burden, even in prayer, but through practical helps yes. so that they can have a little bit of release and know that they have friends who are there to help and shoulder that weight with them. Yes, well. Thank you for being our, our father. I thank you for introducing us to the Lord Jesus Christ, who we love and admire and worship. And I pray that Many, many Cubans would have the wonderful opportunity that we've had to bow down in front of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his yes. name that I offer up these prayers. Amen. Amen and amen. Wow. Praise God. Well, we believe it's done. I love what you said, the logistics, Lord, to work it all out. <laughs> yeah. Amen. We count on him. Yeah. Well, Brian, thanks a lot. I really appreciate uh, your time with us. We're going to go ahead and put your information in the link in the description box. So when people watch this broadcast, uh, they can uh, get a hold of you in your ministry. 
Uh, guys, I want to thank you so much for listening to this uh, Prophetic Worldview broadcast with Brian Stewart, a good friend of mine, great friend of this ministry, and I ask that you continue to pray for him and his family, and that God will continue to open the doors down there in Cuba. And remember this, you don't have any troubles. All you need is faith in God. I love you guys. Blessings.